Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. Oh, this is finally, it's starting to feel like spring. It's warmed up. The birds are going crazy. I've got tree frogs, Arizona tree frog. I've got our native amphibian-like frog lives in my backyard, sings serenades to me every night. He's looking for a mate or she, whichever. I don't know. I didn't, didn't I can't, I keep been trying to find him and I can't. They're little. They're like little tiny, maybe the size of a silver dollar with a big mouth. They just broadcast for, for hundreds of yards, but a beautiful song uh, that, that it sings, loves hanging out by the pond. And so we've got birds back there. Just It's just a delight to be in the backyard, look on the back deck, and overlook your, kind of your domain and enjoy your private gardens. This is what we're famous for in the mountains of Arizona. And you, you can have that. If it doesn't quite feel that way, uh, you, you can plant and plan, plan for it. So Lisa and I, we've been in our house for oh, a lot of years, 10, 12 years now. And so we've progressed. The landscape has matured into this wonderful abode, uh, a room outside our house where we like to spend as much time, especially at the end of the day. Lisa will sip coffee in the front yard in the morning. We go in the backyard in the evening. It's, we love to entertain. It's just a nice place to be. And so one thing that's really looking good in my yard I want to share with you, there's a new series of shrub roses that are just spectacular. I mean, they're just stunning. Now, your grandparents, parents, they grew your classic roses, hybrid teas, floribundas, grandifloras, climbers. These are grafted, specially grafted roses. And I've got thousands of those here at the Garden Center, too. Every color name you can think of, I've got those. But there's a new series of shrub roses coming online that are darn close. I mean, you would be, I mean, a rosarian might be able to tell the difference between a hybrid tea and this easy, elegant rose. But I, I have to take a second look. I have to get up closer going, now, that could be that could be either, a, a, oh, I got it. It's an easy elegance. Oh, I got it. Okay. Shrub roses are no special graft. The beauty of a shrub rose is if winter kills it back, this is really important for you folks at the high elevations, at Highland Pines, the Sick Groom Creeks, uh, the, the Mayor, uh, the uh, uh, Williams and Flagstaffs and Pine Top Lakeside, I mean, these higher elevation gardens, you can go really cold. It has been a couple of years, but it can really get like bone chilling cold. It kills back your roses. Well, if a Easy Elegant Rose gets killed back. It gets burned back to the roots. It's actually grown from its own rootstock. So when it comes back out of the ground, like a perennial does, it will come back true to the plant that it that you planted there. Whereas a hybrid tea or a Floribunda Rose, these have been grafted. We take a very aggressive, hardy rootstock. We'll find a rootstock that's that's just very robust for clay soils, high elevation. We're choosing the rootstock. Then we'll graft that Mr. Lincoln, the Olympia, the Silver Lace, the 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 uh, Henry Fonda, that beautiful yellow rose. We'll graft that onto this more aggressive rootstock. If the cold, if the winter takes it back to the ground and below the graft, what comes back out of the ground is that wild rootstock. It doesn't even remote, you've lost whatever you planted. It goes back to its original wild, crazy root. And these things look like they want to eat your face. I mean, just the roots on these are, are terrible. Well, a shrub rose does not do that. It comes back just like a red, easy elegance or yellow, white variety, whatever whatever variety you put out there, it comes back the same white, the same yellow, the same pink, the same. Uh, so knockout rose is the one that made, that reintroduced shrub roses way back in the day, probably 20 years ago. And yes, it's been great to have, but you know what? It's pink. And then they came out with double pink. And then they came out with a bright pink. Then they came out with a light pink. It's just, it's pink. I'm bored. Come on, give me something new. This new Easy Elegance series has a whole lot of colors, and they figured out how to have the rose larger. 
So it almost trends towards a hybrid tea. And they've introduced some fragrance back into these old-fashioned roses. The beauty with your shrub roses is they're much more disease-resistive. They don't get the aphids and thrip as easily. They don't get mildew. Black spot is not a thing with them. And the deer and javelina are less likely to eat the buds off of those plants. So it's got a lot going for it up in the mountains of Arizona. It's a really great way to go. If you're new to gardening, you say you got your first house, or new to gardening here at high elevation, that's a good one to go with and start with, kind of get your feet wet, because you can't make a mistake. You're going to have success. Then you can move over and start trying out some of the fancy, uh, you know, Grandifloras. These are these are the ones you enter into the fair. They're just stunning. They fill up the whole backyard with fragrance. They're just they're great. But there you've got to actually count back three nodes and cut it at a 45 degree angle and you've got to deadhead it to get it to bloom again. Whereas these easy elegance series, they self prune. They don't need you at all. They just pulsate waves of color without any pruning. Now, now what I do, I'll clean them up. If if I'm going to have a party, I don't want a bunch of dead buds there. So it, that, that flower that was on there, you know, three weeks ago will now die back. It dries up and then it fades. It kind of drops off and then it drops and then it forms a new bud. Well, I don't want that dead thing, that flagging looking there. I kind of clean them up real quick. Takes no time. And now it looks like a fresh new rose every time I've got them in the ground out by the driveway where it's really hot. I mean, right there by the driveway where it's just blistering hot. It loves it. And I have one on the back patio in a big pot. The pot's probably, it's got a a big uh, jade green container. It's maybe, what is that? 20, 20 inches across by about 20 inches deep. It is thriving. I just put Brought it home, put it in straight waters, potting soil, and away it went. Just flew off. It's been in, in bud and bloom ever since. That's how easy roses can be for you. And it's easier here in a dry climate than anywhere else. At this elevation, at the, at the mountain level, we're up in this, we're in the thousands of feet up in the air. The sun is more intense. Well, roses love that. The air is, it's got a breeze to it. Roses love that. There's no mildews and spores and get on there because it's got this air circulation. So they love that. You have less issues. The bugs, there's a few bugs that can get on roses, aphids and thrip mainly. That's about it. Uh, but they don't really care for the shrub roses. So you can, Mike, you can kind of move it over to this direction with great success. There's no plant, no shrub in the mountains of Arizona that blooms like a rose. And nothing can come close. A lilac's It's got more fragrance, but it's six weeks of color and then done. It's green the rest of the time. A rose will give you, you know, four weeks of color, take a break for four weeks, four weeks again of color, take a break, bloom again. It's going to bloom over and over. It pulsates blooms. They call them ever blooming varieties, but really, yes, they always have color on them, but they're showstoppers about every four weeks. I mean, they're just like cut so many flowers. It's ridiculous. That's what I want to see all the time. So I want to see so many flowers, you can't see that it's got foliage. That's a great plant. Oh, speaking of that, there's a new sunflower out that's kind of similar to this Easy Elegance. It's a it's a sterile uh, of sunflower. It's called Sun Believable Sunflower. So it does not put on the giant head. It's not going to give you all the seed. That's not what you want. A lot of sunflowers, the, the, the real showy ones, they're very weedy. They seed everywhere. and They come up all over the yard. They come up through the rock. This new Sun Believable series does not do that. Uh, but it, one plant, here's what its claim to fame is. Um, one plant produces a thousand flowers in one year, this, this growing season. And I did see it in the test gardens. We've got them here at the garden center now, first year ever. I saw them in the, in the test gardens last fall and they were stunning. A sunflower about, I don't know, knee high, two, three feet high by two, three, three feet wide, kind of mounding shaped. And it literally was covered with so many flowers. You couldn't see the foliage. It was that stunning. If you're a gardener that have grown just about everything, you're looking for something different or new, I'm telling you, try the sun believable sunflower. Sun believable. It's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Sun believable uh, sunflower. It's really striking and low maintenance, easy care, self prunes. It's got all the stuff you want. 
for really showy plant and easy care. Be right back with more after this. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Waters with the plants of the week and our gold dust rosemary. You're guaranteed to be the only gardener in the neighborhood with this new variety rosemary in gilded edges of gold. Striking when spilling over raised beds and pots. Loves the heat generated against driveways and bright courtyards. Same zesty culinary delight in a colorful twist for under $10. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love new culinary herbs they love to shop. New to the area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Designer plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. This uh, last week of May, I can't believe May's already come and gone. Now, I'm, I'm actually ready for summer, are you? <laughs> it was a, a different kind of May. It was a different kind of spring. Yeah. So wetter than normal, kind mm-hmm. of chillier than normal. In fact, I don't remember this much water, moisture, in a month in spring. It's definitely unusual and definitely been a lot cooler than I remember it a few years past anyway. Finally starting to warm up. This is good. <laughs> Bring out the short pants, the short sleeves, the t-shirts. And yeah. Just enjoy the sunshine. i my tan. I'm still pretty pasty. <laughs> <laughs> Need some more lake time. <laughs> yeah, I'll true. take you, babe. So this is the garden question segment. So mm-hmm. what do we got garden-wise? What are people talking about out in the neighborhoods? You bet. Uh, Larry is looking for a low-growing shrub. Doesn't really care if it flowers or doesn't flower. Just wants one that's really going to do well here with minimal care. Well, well, you can have your cake and eat it, too. You can have <laughs> flowers and you can have, of course, the easiest ones, no-brainer. I don't know if you call it a shrub, though. I mean, in the Southwest, we call it a shrub. You know, yuccas and agaves. Ah. And you jump over to, you know, cacti. It's not, it's evergreen, does bloom. It's not really shrubby, though. So what's your definition of shrub? That kind of depends on where you've moved from. True. Those are Southwestern things. Uh, the true shrubs, what you're seeing blooming right now all around town, there's a little knee high shrub called Potentia. If you're from the Midwest, you call it, call, call it Potentella, but uh, you don't pronounce the two L's. In, 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 anyway, that's a low-growing shrub about knee-high, knee-wide, yellow flowers the size of quarters all over it. Stunning. Easy to grow. Animals don't eat it. Takes full sun. We use it in commercial settings all the time. You just can't kill this little plant. It's amazing how tough it is. A companion plant that goes side-by-side side with that would be salvia. Uh, or autumn sage is a, a red blooming plant, red, purple, pink, so it's different Maybe. colors. <laughs> yeah. It has a lot of colors, but it's the same size, mm-hmm. kind of more vase shaped. This one's you know, potent tea is more uh, kind of Ball mounding orange. shape. And another one that's from the Midwest is spirea, kind of an old mm-hmm. fashioned plant, but there's several different low growing spireas that are just tough. Deer don't eat them. Uh, Havelina don't bother them, so they just c- consistent. Are they good out in full sun? The f- bliss- blistering hot, just okay. tough. Mm-hmm. They're right up there with the viburnums kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Really, really well. And then uh, Raphaeliptus, or mm-hmm. Indian hawthorn, mm-hmm. is a good evergreen. Blooms and it's been blooming. Now it's starting to transition from bloom to new growth. That's That's one where you really want to probably show up and take the – we've got a whole area out there. It's nothing but sun. Uh, it's out in the sun because those plants love the sun and it, low growing shrubs. We've got a whole low growing sun, sun section. And then we've also got a whole nother section of low growing shady shrubs underneath the shade fabric beside the greenhouse. 
And so you can come take a look and peruse them, and, and we've tried to organize them and sign them. Though we've got people running around that are kind of plant experts that can help you kind of hone in. Mm -hmm. What I find is when you go take people around, uh, you'll see they'll, they'll come back to a certain plant that seems to always draw to them. So just, just get that one. If it calls to you, go for it. All right. So good suggestions. Mm -hmm. What else we got? Sure. Michael put in lawn seed in April, came up looking beautiful. His question is now, how often should he feed it? How often should he water it? How does he take care of that beautiful new lawn? So grassy looks so good in early spring. So this is pretty easy. There's, you'll need to apply something once a week. And you start in March or April in your, your situation. And you go through October. So you start with the all-purpose plant food, the 744 uh, fertilizer. That's one we put together here. The main ingredient in that is cottonseed meal, which will increase the root growth. But secondly, the second main ingredient is bird guano. That's, that's like green growth. So that'll make lawns go crazy. Do that one month. The following month, you, you follow up with humic, H-U-M-I-C, humic. Humic will, will encourage deeper roots again. And then mainly it gets rid of the thatch. It makes sure the, the lawn is very thick, chokes out all the weeds. So you rotate that. You start in March with all-purpose food. Then you switch to Humic once a month. And a bag will cover about 2,000 square feet. So I don't know how many feet he's got. We can do the math real quick. If you do that, that program, March through October, you will not have weeds. You will never have to dethatch. You'll never have to aerate. You'll have the most beautiful, lush lawn. It'll be green 12 months out of the year. It's just stunning. It's the best program ever. You'll never use chemicals because you don't need weed and feed and all this kind of stuff. Just all-purpose food and humic once a month. Trade it off, and you will have your, – your, your neighbors will be envious of the green lawn that you've, you've got. So you said – one one month you use fertilizer, the next month you use humic, or do yep. you do it in the same month? Nope. One month you use all-purpose food, the other per other month you use humic. Okay. So March, food, uh, April, humic. May, food, June, humic. July, food, August, humic. That's what you do. Okay. And what about watering? Because that was... Is it like once a week, twice a week, or does it just vary depending upon? Now it's been cool, so you haven't had to have the pressure's been off. In fact, people have been overwatering. Mm -hmm. As we get warmer, which we're starting to see the warmth, uh, you, now you're going to have to water a brand new lawn. It depends what kind of grass he's got. You might be every day for a bluegrass, probably two, two times a week for a fescue. Might be once a once a week for a, a Bermuda. Uh, probably he's not using Bermuda up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. It's more of a desert kind of grass. But bluegrass, ryegrass, or, or fescue are the three grasses we use at high altitude because they stay green longer. Those kind of grasses are going to be anywhere from every other day to every third or fourth day, somewhere, somewhere in there. When you walk across the grass and you see your footprints, You've gone too too long. It's time to water. <laughs> if the grass starts to lay down, if there's there's certain indications you get used to to looking for, um, or take a screwdriver and kind of throw it in there. And if it goes in the ground real easy, it's moist. If it's dry and crusty, you can't get that bigger screwdriver in there. It's dry. Time to water. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Macy has a question. She's looking for a shrub to go in a pot, large pot by her front door. That gets no sun. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, you know, uh, hydrangeas. We got a beautiful load of hydrangeas. Loves that kind of spot. We grow, grow ours in a big pot. So that'd be a good choice. Uh, Lily of the Valley is probably one of the best you could choose because it's evergreen. Mm -hmm. Blooms in the spring. It's just, it's a little shrub, cute, loves shade, fragrant. It's got everything you want in a shrub for the shade. And it blooms. I mean, just a really great one. Of course, uh, holly is what they use in the Midwest uh, or East Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Use, use. Daphne's. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's one. Come talk to us. <laughs> and there's just too many choices. So that's one. That's not something you do by email or, or by a phone call. You come in, you get the grand tour, and you can see them. That would be the front greenhouse. That whole front patio is all shade plants. And then off to the side of the greenhouse, you see all the shade fabric. That's there because that's the shade section. We're protecting those shady plants. Mm -hmm. Pick any one of those. You just thrive. A Wygelia, um, 
I would really focus on Lily of the Valley. It's such a good, handsome-looking, tidy, low-care plant in a container. It's going to thrive for you. Definitely. And there's a lot of annuals you could put up there, oh, true. too. Good. Coleus, fuchsias. Uh, begonias. There's some beautiful, like the angel wing begonias. I usually try to put one of those by our front door every year. Yeah. Uh, and it gets so big that you can't get to the front door. <laughs> Just you <laughs> trim it back, keep it shaped. So E. coleus is, you know, doesn't like the spring. It loves summer. It loves right. this time of year and going forward. And then when uh, the sun sets you know, a little bit lower in, in, in fall and winter, you can put your pansies and your violas up there in that same spot. You can transition that mm-hmm. color, always keeping color yeah. by the front door so you can have that. Oh, I agree. I think it's so inviting when you have some color by your front door, especially if it's a dark front door. Yeah. Great choices. So, shrubs, come see us here at Waters Garden Center. We'll give the grand tour for your front door. Be right back with more on... The Mountain Gardener. You're listening to Ken Lane, aka The Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Hi, Lisa here with the plants of the week and our dwarf blue plumbago. If you can't grow blue plumbago, it's time to move to the city. This perennial ground cover is quick to spread and puts up with a lot of abuse from dry soil to neglect. The peacock blue flowers are held wide and very prominent against the small bronzy green foliage. Grows in any kind of garden, all for 11 bucks. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love easy perennials, they love to shop. Gee, my flowers just bloom too much. Said no one, ever. Hi, this is Kenneth Waters. We had a crazy winter and everyone's ready for flowers in the garden. Waters Flower Power is made specifically for Arizona that gives flowers that extra boost to burst into bloom. It's an energy kick in the plants. Get ready for roses that rule, peppers that pop, and tomatoes that triumph. More power to the flowers with Flower Power at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. Now I had started out the show mentioning my roses. It's just, just I've got some new roses. I'm really happy with them in my backyard. Share what variety it was. Easy elegance rose. We mentioned this unbelievable sunflower. I, I in, in my front yard by the driveway, I've got a whole series of roses. Basically, that whole side of the driveway from the driveway to the property line is nothing but roses, layers and layers of roses, and it is spectacular. I've got Cecil Bruners. It's a big climber. It's got to be eight feet tall, covered in pink flowers, covered. I've got, stepping down to that, I've got uh, uh, carpet roses, which are easy care. They get up about knee high, and they just have different colors coming on. Then I've got some shrub roses out there as well. It's just, I want it to be a, a rose garden, but low, low, low care. They've got to prune themselves, take care of themselves, not get mildew or, or problems. I want beauty with no care. And I go in in March and trim them up, and that's about it. That's all I do with it. And I fertilize them. I do fertilize and I irrigate them. That's it. The carpet roses, I was having a struggle. Let me share what was happening. I've probably got 10 or 12. I mean, it's quite a series of these carpet roses. comes in many different colors, and I've purposely planted several. I grouped them in in groups of three, and I've got these big splotches of reds and yellows and apple blossoms and pinks, and I've got these different colors. Well, two of the roses in this entire group were just struggling having issues. I'm going, what the heck is going on? You guys are not performing. And you know, if you don't perform in my yard, I will dig you up and throw you away like you were nothing. So you better turn it around. And so I scolded it, talked to it sweetly. And then, then I took a quick test hole. I looked in the soil and lo and behold, it wasn't the rose. It was grubs. I had little white worms that were eating the roots off these poor roses. And so it wasn't their fault. It was nature's fault. Well, there are no more grubs. I took care of them. That's really easy to deal with. There's, I just came, got to the garden center. I went, okay, grub killer, grub killer, where is it? 
and they make a grub killer that you just sprinkle on the ground, water it in, goes through the through the root zone, and then obliterates grubs. These these worms, they they their diet is not dirt. Their diet is roots. And so they were eating the roots. So the root mass is actually smaller on these roses than the rest of them. So you could see it pronounced. They were struggling. And so if you've got some some plants in your yard that are just not performing, they aren't catching up, they aren't, they aren't what you remember, there, something is going on, it might be something that is unseen in the ground. Just take a quick test hole. I was just about to put grub killer down over the whole bed anyway, but when I found, if you find one grub, one white worm, there, I, I just did the entire bed. I, one bag will do like a thousand square feet, just way more than I need. I didn't want any left. I'm going, okay, if, if this is a beetle larva is what that is. These beetles were roaming around last summer. They laid eggs in the soil. They've hatched. They came out and started to form. They started eating. And now this larva st- stage of a beetle is now eating the roots of my plant. They'll come out this summer and start flying around and then lay more eggs. It's this cycle that we get into. Well, I don't want that cycle in my yard. I want them over in someone else's yard, not not here. I want my roses to bloom. And so as soon as I take this pressure, I'm sure in a couple of weeks, I'll give a report going, man, the roses are looking good. They rebounded just like crazy. So they're doing, they're doing fine. So if you just take that edge off your roses, off your plants, it'll really be a game changer, especially those things that, that bloom. They need, they're either going to put that energy, the photosynthesis is either going to create roots or it's going to create blooms but not both. So if the roots are constantly being eaten off, you're going to take all that sugar and start pushing it down and give the grubs even more food to eat off. And so it's this race. So if they aren't blooming quite right, that's probably the reason why grubs get a grub killer, put it down, like spread it like fertilizer, water it in. And one application does it for like a year. You're you're good to go. Anyway, that's an inside scoop I found in my own yard. Just another tip that I did. I knew that those were stressed because the root mass is is smaller. I wanted to encourage more roots on those, that block of roses. So that portion of the rose bed of that garden of that landscape, I I put on in addition to the, to the grub killer, I put on humic, H-U-M-I-C. It's humic acid. It's a granular, again, it's it's a granular product, but it feeds the soil that encourages deeper roots, more roots to come out. It's not really a food by any means. It does the opposite of food. It doesn't feed the plant. It changes the pH a little bit, but really it feeds the soil. So as those grubs die off, they're going to become compost. The roots are going to want to grow through that and and regrow. So I wanted to regrow my my roots as fast as I could. If you have a, a willow tree that's just stressed out, parts of it are dying, give it humic. If you've got uh, a, a series of lilacs and they just aren't blooming, like this one bloomed, this one didn't, give it give it humic. I mean, give it just humic acid. It really is a game changer. If you've got uh, plants that got burned off, let's say the the frost that late winter caused the the roots to the the leaves not to leaf out as fast as you remember, give it humic. It'll help it root out and get, it'll stimulate the, the root growth of the plant. So it just starts sending off new roots. If you get the roots, the, the second the roots go, the top growth goes. And so you get better growth. It, it, it makes plants come out of stress better. It's the thing I can give you. Those two things, grubs, things that are stressed, humic. Those are my tips for you. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, water is with the plants of the week and our gold dust rosemary. You're guaranteed to be the only gardener in the neighborhood with this new variety rosemary and gilded edges of gold. Striking when spilling over raised beds and pots. Loves the heat generated against driveways and bright courtyards. Same zesty culinary delight in a colorful twist for under $10. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love new culinary herbs love to shop. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. 
We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. All right, we've got Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week, and she's bringing her just some inspirational tips that she can share with us. So I think we should talk about rabbits. Rabbits? Javelina. Javelina proof <laughs> plants. Ha- animal resistive. Bright sunny shrubs. Uh, or what do you have in mind? <laughs> <laughs> well, we could talk about rabbits, but um, I one of the things that I've noticed talking to people in the store looking around is you know that a lot of them have moved from California or the Midwest, and they're looking for different types of plants to put in their yard that are different from what they, you know, traditionally had for a long, you know, how many boxwoods do you need in a yard? (laughs) How much photinia can you put in a yard? So they're looking for things to have a more definite Southwest flair to them. So I thought we'd talk about some of those shrubs that have that look. Southwest, but everyone wants to come in here and and, and have, have us look like Phoenix. Mm -hmm. You're thinking that Southwest desert cactus. Show me your cactus section. I want it to winter over. Or they bring up cactus from down yeah. down south, and they bring it uphill, and it grows fine through the summer, and then come winter, it turns into black mush. Mm-hmm. There's a southwest flare you can have, but it's not going to be cacti or very many. It's going to be something else, something mm-hmm. high altitude, something chaparral or, or manzanita looking kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So great. This is, this is a good topic because you can't have phoenix. Right. In the mountains of Arizona. You don't have Phoenix down in Phoenix. Up here, we're in God's country, we're pines and junipers <laughs> and manzanitas and a, a banana yuccas and so many other mm-hmm. great, better choices. Oh, I agree. And I love you talking about manzanita. There's We have three different varieties, maybe four different varieties of manzanita, and they do so well here. A little tricky, so, you know, people want to overwater them constantly. Um, and that's the trick with them is don't overwater, put them in well-drained soil, and they perform so nicely here. Just a nice evergreen shrub that really requires minimal care. Uh, the yuccas, of course, which everybody, the red yuccas. Um, my new favorite is brake light yucca. I really like that one because it doesn't get as big. It's kind of more of a compact dwarf variety. Um, so it's easier to put in your yard. It's not going to get out of control. The uh, blossoms on it are just that really, really bright red, and the hummingbirds absolutely love that. Like one. a fire engine red or brake light red. That's, mm-hmm. There's Pure another one. So rosy, the rosy. There's a the bigger coral, coral rose. Mm-hmm. Is that it? Yucca? Coral glow. Coral glow gets big. Yeah, I mean a great big red yucca. Mm-hmm. I mean if you eat something in the corner of the yard that gets four or five feet tall, but the same, it's like brake light yucca on steroids. There's a lot of choices to pick from on on those on that yucca family. Mm-hmm. One of the new ones that we got in is called Bright Star Yucca. That thing, it's a yellow, oh, that's neat. mostly yellow, but a little bit of vari- variegation of green in it. It, I think, out in your yard, it would really stand out nicely. Uh, be really pretty to mix in with some artichoke agaves or. Um, What's the other? Perii agave. Yeah. It would really give it a nice look out there. Or century plants, the other name that goes by. In fact, our century plant is blooming this year. It's been 15 years. When uh-huh. it planted it 15 years ago, it finally decided this is the year, and it's growing by a foot a day almost. <laughs> it's already up above seven feet. So all around town, you're seeing this uh, s- small agave up mm-hmm. about three foot tall with this huge uh, stalk coming up out of the middle of it that will be in bloom here for the rest of the season. As mm-hmm. soon as it starts blooming, it's magnificent. Oh, they stay in bloom a long time. Yeah. And even when the bloom is faded, it's really cool to have that stalk out yeah. there too. Uh, baby Rita, you were talking about cactuses, and you're right. Most people are surprised how few <laughs> varieties of cactus actually do well here in this area. But Baby Rita... Um, I really like, especially for yards, because unlike the big standard prickly pear, it's not going to, they're going to take over your whole entire yard. It's easier to deal with. It's got smaller paddles to it. So it's just easier to trim up and deal with. And it still has that really nice kind of purpley color to it. I think the flower is even brighter mm-hmm. on their little Rita. It just sounds cuter. <laughs> sounds like it should be brighter and cheerier and happier. 
Definitely. Then it won't spread. Like some of them spread over the yard so much. They're so high maintenance and then they're pokey. Mm-hmm. You fill up your trash can with it. And you're going, where do I put all these pads? <laughs> so the little Rita, mm-hmm. so much easier to maintain, yet winter hardy. Very tough for oh, the mountains. Yeah. yeah. Smoke bush. That's another one of my favorites here. The color on that is that really dark burgundy leaf to it and it puts on those little blossoms that are wispy they kind of just take in the wind and blow in the wind uh really pretty plant for here um what's that about six to eight feet tall or does it get bigger yeah, head high it can go yeah. taller if you let it it'll go tall as a rooftop mm-hmm. very few usually people trim it back in the winter and keep it down to about right. lilac size or forsythia mm-hmm. size that one's so tough you see it a lot in uh, road plantings where they have a median down the center of the road and they're throwing the smoke bush in there that tells you how tough that that plant is one that's like that for the midwest folks it's a midwestern plant but the new variety there's a new purple leafed crepe myrtle mm. It doesn't look like a crepe myrtle. It looks like a it looks like a smoke bush yeah. or or a sestina plum over these mm-hmm. natives. It's got this but it's a much glossier leaf to it. Very pretty, but it has that uh crepe myrtle kind of, of flower to that fluorescent color. Mm-hmm. Caryopteris is another really good bush for those kind of southwestern y looks that you want to go to. Caryopteris blooms with a kind of a bluish purple flower on it. Boy, can it take the heat and still look nice. Um, there's a variety called, Sa- Sa- oh, I forget the name of it, Sunrise Surf, Sapphire Surf. I forget the name, Sapphire something, but it's smaller. So it only gets about two feet tall, three feet wide. So the regular Black Knight or Bluebeard Caryopteris, they get, what, four by four, I would say? Yeah. So this little guy can fit into the smaller corners or into your perennial beds. Just a really cute one. And then, of course, butterfly bush. We all, everybody should have a butterfly bush, right? Absolutely. They're different sizes, <laughs> yeah, so you can have you can fun with those. And lots yeah. of colors to choose mm-hmm. from. I think a lot of people think of butterfly bush as the, you know, the great big monsters get six, eight feet tall. They get out of control. Uh, but they have the new Buzz series, which is about four foot tall. Very, very attractive. Um, Miss Molly, uh, Miss Ruby, those, oh, the colors on those are just so dynamic. Um, and they aren't going to get out of control. And then they have the new Pugster series, which is has the traditional colors of the white and the purple and the pinks. But they only get about two foot, two by two. Who would guess you can have a two foot tall butterfly bush? And the great thing about them is their blooms are the same size or maybe even a little bit bigger than the standard oh butterfly bush. Oh my gosh, bush. sounds wonderful. They're absolutely gorgeous. And then chase tree, if you're looking for a nice tree to go out into your yard. They're, again, not overly large, 12 feet or so. Yeah. Blooms an amazingly long time in the summer. I'm always surprised how long it blooms. But it has beautiful purple blossoms on it that kind of remind me of a, of a lilac bloom almost. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Not the same fragrance, but the same no, beauty. No, but very, very pretty. Companion plant would be but, um, um, desert willow. Mm-hmm. And chase trees kind of go together. That, that same service berry. There's several trees, small trees that kind of native adapt well. They love the mountains. That are super tough. Mm-hmm. Red hot poker. Now we're kind of getting into perennials, but red hot poker is. They're getting hummingbirds. Love that bush. They love the blooms on it. Boy, you can throw it out in the middle of the heat. It doesn't take a lot of water, and it is a really pretty, uh, just kind of stands up out in the yard out there. Very unusual looking. Um, and then, sorry, I'm losing track. I've got, usually I don't get this far <laughs> on my list. Of course, we've always mentioned salvia, the salvia greggy eyes. Um, it's, it just performs really well here. And it, and it doesn't get overly large. And you can get the purple one, the purple ignition. They have a new one called white ignition. I haven't seen that. Is that yeah. in stock? They just it said is they in come stock. In? Oh, I have to look at that. Must I have really just come off the truck. like it put up against the red, the radio reds, to have the red, white, and then some purples in it. It's very, very pretty. The red, reds show up when they're surrounded. Whites show up when they're surrounded by other colors. Yeah. And they make other colors really pop. Yarrow, uh, the moonshine yarrow, again, just screams yellow out there in the yard. And, of course, Gara, too. Great choices for flowering southwestern shrubs for the mountains of Arizona. Thank you, Lisa. 
Be right back with more Kennelly Selene and the Mountain Gardeners. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. You need an area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Designer plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Dwarf Blue Plumbago. If you can't grow blue Plumbago, it's time to move to the city. This perennial ground cover is quick to spread and puts up with a lot of abuse from dry soil to neglect. The peacock blue flowers are held wide and very prominent against the small bronzy green foliage. Grows in any kind of garden, all for 11 bucks. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love easy perennials, they love to shop. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. Let me share the biggest blunder I find people make new to the mountains of Arizona. They're coming in. We've, I mean, no one's really from Arizona. We're all from other places, including myself. I was born in Virginia. Yeah, my parents retired here, and I went to mid-high and high school and college, and I've had all my kids here, and I married a Prescottonian. But, you know, most, that's pretty rare to find a Prescottonian. It's really rare to find someone from Camp Verde. I mean, you just don't see that very often. You just We're all from other places. And so uh, gardening's different here. You poor, poor folks from the south you keep coming in asking i want a crepe myrtle tree where are they i don't see them growing around here it's the same climate i want one give me one i'm going uh i'm sorry that's not a good southern accent that was that was actually an insult i apologize to all of you from from the south but uh crepe myrtles don't the trees don't grow here the reason is they'll start to grow and then all of a sudden we'll get this real bitter cold that knocks them right back to the ground. So you'll see crepe myrtle shrubs growing here and not all the varieties. There's, there's hardier varieties than others. So out of all the crepe myrtles, you can only grow you know, a handful that will actually winter over and thrive for multiple you know, decades down the road. And, and you won't find trees. It'll be shrubs. Uh, yeah, um, you poor, poor folks from the deserts, you want your hibiscus. I want Southern California, hibiscus. Palm Springs, hibiscus. Uh, Tucson, hibiscus. Phoenix, hibiscus. I want my hibiscus. They don't grow up here. They, that big tropical hibiscus does not grow up here. It gets too cold. It kills them off. And so it will grow just fine. And I've got some for sale here. It's in the back greenhouse where the annuals are. We sell it like an annual. Bougainvillea, we sell like an annual. You can have it, but you're going to need a greenhouse to winter it over in or bring it indoors or have friends down in Phoenix you give it to. They winter it over for you. Then you bring it back up the hill. And that's, we do that a lot with family down in the valley. So that, that's an option. Or you just enjoy it for what it is and you let it go and you plant a new one next year. Uh, those are all options. There is one hibiscus that grows very, very well. Two, actually. Mashudos hibiscus or Confederate rose hibiscus, depending on what part of the country you're coming from. Mashudo is the actual Latin variety. This is a very large, very tropical-looking hibiscus. But it dies back to the ground. It, you actually treat it like a perennial. It won't come back from the shrub. The stems will actually die back to the ground. You trim it off right at the ground level, and it'll grow four new, I mean, four foot stems with these huge red flowers, typically pink, maybe a white with a red center. But Mashudo's hibiscus is the only one that comes close to the tropical variety because it, it, it dies back to the ground and comes back. The other one is called Rose of Sharon. That is actually a hibiscus. You look at the Latin name, it's hibiscus. But the common name that everyone describes it by is a cold, hardy, 
Rose of Sharon. The, the hibiscus flower, it does look like a hibiscus. It's only maybe four inches across instead of a flower that's the size of your hand. So it doesn't have the same type of big, you know, hovering flower over this foliage. Uh, but, it, but it makes up for it in sheer quantity. Literally, I've had rows of Sharon that, were, that had so many buds on it, it literally fell over because it couldn't take the weight of all the flowers that were on it. That one is actually hardy. There's not, you don't have the deep, rich colors like you get with the tropical variety, but boy, they are stunning. And they do very, very well in the mountains of, El- uh, uh, of Arizona. They go down to, I think, a zone 5, zone 4, some crazy cold, minus 20 degrees. They love the cold winters. They come back and they thrive. They just do so well. So if you're new to the area, do a little homework. You can't just have uh, what you were growing back home in, in, in you know, San Diego. Pretty much Phoenix, all the warm zones. You might as well just... Erase, reboot, start over because it is not well, – everything you've learned does not pertain to here. We're going to be more like the Midwest. We're going to be more like Wyoming, Montana, Colorado than we are to Southern California or Southern Phoenix, Southern Arizona. We're not – we're not to the deserts. We're not tropical. We are high-altitude mountain four-season climates. So you need plants that can take that. Another thing to watch is, let's say from the Midwest, you all grow Dutzia and Wygelia and your hollies and uh, all these very beautiful plants. Uh, and and they're, they're full sun kind of plants out there. Here, they might need some shade. Our sun is more intense. And so you'll put your you'll put that beautiful um, Japanese maple out there. And the tag says full sun. I come from an area where it grew in full sun. All of a sudden you come here and it burns. The, it, it will grow in full sun, but it will be the ugliest plant you have ever experienced. You'll be able to keep it alive, but you'll hate just every moment of the experience. It needs to be in more shade because our sun is more intense. And so I grow my, I've got lace leaf Japanese maples. I've got red leaf Japanese maples where they have a half day of sun. They'll take the morning. They'll take the evening. They'll take full shade. They will not take right out there in the middle of the yard, surrounded by rock in full sun at this altitude. They're not, they're not going to grow as well. And so I'd say the same thing with your, with your yews, your all of your hollies, uh, what are, uh, rhododendrons, azaleas, those things you grew in full sun in other parts of the country, here we'll grow them in half a day of sun, if that. That peak, uh, during the peak of the season, that 10 to 2, 11 to 3, that, that midday heat is pretty intense. Uh, it, can, it can really cause plants to struggle. So you really want to, those areas, you want to be really careful or get some advice. Come in and ask us. Take a picture you got a cell phone on you. Take a picture, bring it in, let us look at it. We can tell you, when I'm looking at a screen, I probably look at 20 different varieties, different ver- brands every day. Um, I'm looking not at the space. Yeah, it's a big, open, gaping space. I know you need something there, and that's why you're here. I can tell that, too. What I'm looking at is the other plants around that space. I'm going, oh, if a lilac grows there, well, a forsythia will grow there too, or a quince will grow there too, or a rose. This rose will grow there too. I'm looking at the other plants going, oh, what can I companion plant with those? Or I'm looking at the shade. If it's a, if a, if a all I see is a trunk sticking up, I go, oh, it's underneath a tree. I can tell that. And then I'm looking at how much shade is underneath them. I'm going, whoa, that is a full shade area. We need, we need something. A, a, a Russian sage will hate that area. A rose would hate that area. A, a rose of Sharon would hate that. Let's, let's guide them over here towards Wygelia and, and Daphne and Lily of the Valley. They're going to thrive in that kind of space. I'm looking at shadowing and companion plants mainly when I look at a screen. I don't need a lot of exp- – the other thing I can't quite tell, this is just you could help me out when you come in. Any of the staff, any of the plant ambassadors we got here at Waters Garden Center, we, this is all we do all day long, and we love it. We deal – it's a passion of ours. Help folks get the right plant in the right place. Uh, success. Uh, it's like I'm always telling the staff at staff meetings, we're not selling plants. We're not in the plant business. We're in the plant gardening experience. If they, if they struggle – 
That is a, the most horrible experience you can have. We want to make sure they have success. We're selling garden experiences, not plants. You got to make sure they get the right experience. And so we really want you to be successful. And so we'll get you the right stuff to plant it with. We'll get you the right, the right plant to go in that right space. So we're all looking to help you hone in and get the right, right place. Other kind of uh, blooming summer plants. You're getting uh, all of your, your silver berries have this beautiful fragrance. A small flower, but beautiful fragrance. Mandina. Beautiful clusters of white flowers that turn into red berries. Your raphaeliptus. I've been in grow or Indian hawthorn, little uh, knee high plant, evergreen has been covered in pink flowers, fragrant like crazy. All the roses, I think we grow better roses than anywhere else in the country because it's dry and it's bright. We got a slight breeze that keeps them from getting black spot and mildews. We grow them easier than anywhere else. You can have a lot of color in your yard. And then I think there's a whole series of natives, or I call them Western natives. They might not be native to right here, Yavapai County, but they grow in the Southern Rockies really well. Those are going to be things like choke cherry, grows wild. Uh, Eliagnus grows wild. Uh, Apache plume grows wild. Uh, there's a whole series of, of yuccas starting to bloom right now, with these bright red flowers. Banana yucca, bright white flower. Agaves are now extending, or century plant. They're starting to extend that real tall flower. All of those can grow here in your own backyard if you place them in just the right place. Lots of tips. Not quite done. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Hi, Waters with the plants of the week and our gold dust rosemary. You're guaranteed to be the only gardener in the neighborhood with this new variety rosemary in gilded edges of gold. Striking when spilling over raised beds and pots. Loves the heat generated against driveways and bright courtyards. The same zesty culinary delight in a colorful twist for under $10. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love new culinary herbs they love to shop. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Dwarf Blue Plumbago. If you can't grow blue Plumbago, it's time to move to the city. This perennial ground cover is quick to spread and puts up with a lot of abuse from dry soil to neglect. The peacock blue flowers are held wide and very prominent against the small bronzy green foliage. Grows in any kind of garden, all for 11 bucks. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love easy perennials, they love to shop. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert, Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. If ever there was a time to add some herbs to your garden, now is your peak time. Now through June, really, is your peak time to be putting perennials in. Uh, they start to really show off a lot of choices. Perennials, remember, perennial and permanent both start with peace. So you plant it once and done. It comes back every year. Annuals are those things that produce like crazy for this year, but then they're just done. So perennial and permanent. That's the best. That's how I teach the staff on what's a perennial mean because uh, you get there's just that confusion to it. But most of the of the herbs are perennial here. I would say all of them except really basil. Well, lemon, lemongrass, what else? Uh, cilantro. They can come back, but they'll come back by seed. They aren't going to come back by the roots. But all your others, mints. I probably have 10 different varieties of mint, from strawberry mint to pineapple mint to chocolate mint to spear and pe spearmint and peppermint. Uh, your, your verbenas, uh, oreganos. I've got probably eight different varieties of orego, including the Mexican oregano. They're perennial. They come back every year. Uh, creeping thyme, or just thyme, or thyme, thyme. Uh, I've got golden thyme, and Italian thyme, and French thyme, and creeping thyme, and woolly thyme. There's lots of varieties. This is your season to be putting those in. And I would go so far as to say, I think the weather has turned nice enough. We can put basil in and, and go f all in. Uh, cilantro, go all in. Most folks wait, or, or plant that way too early, and they should have waited to put those in, those two plants, cilantro and, and um, 
basil, they do not like spring. They are not interested in spring. They want nothing to do about a cold night. They want it to be warm day, warm night, and just they just like they like it bright and warm. That's that's what they like. Give it to them. Well, that's all we're going to see from this point forward. So you can really plant those and just watch them thrive. You're going to have so much pesto. You don't know what to do with them all. I mean, get the grill powered up. They are ready to go. Salsas are ready to be sliced and diced. More cilantro, please. It's going to be good. Now is your time to be putting in your your fresh herbs. And there is nothing better than fresh herbs. Oh, my goodness. They're just so good. You can also put all the veggies in. I think now is good to go. I'd really focus on the vegetables that form a fruit, things that form an actual fruit, watermelons and cantaloupes and uh, you, you look at tomatoes and peppers, eggplants would love to be planted now. That's another one that does not like spring. It wants to wait until it is warm. It likes the summer. All your pumpkins, they prefer being waiting until you're better off waiting till June uh, for pumpkins and many of that stuff. So they like the heat. They'll just sit there and look at you waiting to die, waiting for the first cold night. Okay, I'm cold and I want to die. If it gets cold anymore, I'm out of here. But if you wait till it's summer, they go, oh, this is great. Oh, I feel nice and toasty warm. Let's grow. And they take off. But really, the point being with this segment, perennials, your perennial, your native perennials from agaves and yuccas to your garas and echinaceas and salvias. There's this beautiful uh, little shrub has covered in red flowers that hummingbirds just dearly love. Every yard should have at least one. I've, I've got red, of course. I've got several different colors of red. But we've also got pink and white and purple and apple blossom and apricot. We've got all these colors you can play with because now through June is like your best selection and the best time to be planting herb, perennial herbs, perennial flowers, perennials. I'd say perennial vegetables, strawberries, uh, rhubarb. They, they're all good to go right now. Put them in now. You have great, tremendous success. Whether it's in a container, raised bed, in the ground, now's your time. You're in that peak sweet spot for adding to your own yard. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. Let me tell you, you never get tired of talking to fans of the show. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.